appreciate his um, testimony of faithfulness. We appreciate their church. They're doing a tremendous job reaching their area of the world over there. And uh, brother, if you would take just a second, give us a little update about the bus ministry and how that's going and then open your Bible and just preach as long as you want to. Amen. Awesome. Appreciate it. Good to have you. Amen. Thank you. Well, good to be here this morning. I think we've had church already on a Monday morning and uh, appreciate this church, this ministry and uh, give you a little update. Our, our ministry, we're we are um, having a time. We're having a great time. And uh, I've been there almost 41 years now and uh, growing up at church and, and now pastoring uh, 15 years coming on. And, and uh, this coming August, we will be 50 years in the bus ministry. And I'm thankful for what God is doing in our ministry. I'll share a few uh, testimonies throughout the message this morning, just to give you an idea. Uh, thank you for your support of Bust Them In. And uh, this couple of weeks ago, we hit bus number 70, and uh, we've been able to give 70 buses away across the country uh, and uh, eight buses internationally uh, to eight different uh, countries in the world. And uh, just amazing, amazing um, um, opportunity to see what God is doing. And uh, every week I get uh, messages from folks and just uh, pictures and just seeing what the Lord is doing. And uh, we believe the bus ministry still works at our place, and uh, God is still doing a great work. And yesterday we had our big day, and we had uh, a couple hundred young people in our church and had 33 saved and uh, just uh, family saved and parents saved. And it's just amazing. God is still working in our day. God's not dead. God's not uh, absent in our society, and uh, I'm thankful for it. John chapter 5 this morning. Again, honored to be with you. Appreciate your pastor, his friendship, and, and uh, what God is doing here. You look at, as I've said oftentimes, in the state of Maryland, a lot of people write off Maryland as a, a bastion of, of evil. Uh, but in the midst of darkness, God is, has raised up churches all over Maryland that are doing a work, that are shining a light. And this is one of them. And uh, I'm thankful for it. John chapter 5, Brother Shiflet asked me to speak this morning, and I've, to be honest with you, I've wrestled with what the Lord wanted me to speak on, so I don't know, maybe you'll get two or three messages together, I'm not sure, but uh, we'll put them together, see what God does, and uh, um, I recognize the young people here, I don't know, maybe you'd want to be in church rather than in math or grammar, if you're next to your grammar teacher, don't say amen, All right, don't do that, and uh, my wife's a math teacher, so... Uh, I, don't, I told her, I said, I'm good with numbers, but when you add those letters, I get confused. <laughs> and so, like, I don't know why you're putting those letters in there for. And, uh, but thankful for Christian education. John chapter 5, the Bible says there, after this was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped into the inn was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Just imagine, for 38 years, this man was dealing with this ailment. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had, now, had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Then the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me in the pool, but while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. I want to give you a message this morning entitled, I Have No Man. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful. We're thankful for what you've done in our hearts. We're thankful for the time that you came by our way and saved us. 
Lord, this morning, as we open your word, may we consider the scripture. Speak to our hearts. Lord, if we come and to this building and to this place and, and we leave not having heard from you, we failed. God, we certainly want to leave different than we came. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When I was six years old, my, I remember like it was yesterday, we lived in Southern Maryland down in a beautiful home. We lived about a mile from the beach. And uh, I remember as a kindergarten student, I remember uh, the 4th of July um, celebration, the uh, bicentennial, 1976. I remember being in a parade. That's one of my earliest memories. And I remember I was in a parade. I had decked out my bike and I was in this parade and we were having a time. We were living the life. And I, I was uh, the oldest. Uh, my brother had just been born and, 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 I, and, and, and my mom was pregnant. And, and I remember that was the earliest memory. But then a couple years after that, I remember as the oldest, I remember my mom and dad bringing me into a room and into the living room and saying, son, um, dad and I are getting a divorce. And we're going to we're going to sell the home and you and the kids are going to go uh, and live with your aunt in uh, Riverdale, Maryland. And I remember my heart was broken. And I remember my, my mom telling me, uh, I had my own room. I remember my mom telling me, I want you to go to your room. I want you to get uh, your favorite toys and put them in this box. And you're going to take those with you. And, you know, as a kid, all my toys were my favorite. But I couldn't take them all. And, and I remember getting a box and carrying that box to the car. And, and, and I never saw that home again. And that began a season in our life that was a, uh, really was a storm. And, and I remember as a little boy, I remember carrying the weight of mom and dad now not being together. I remember carrying that weight of, of no one to be able to talk to. And, and I became a little angry about what was happening in my life. And, and just like this man, he, was, he had gone through 38 years of a storm. As a little boy, I was going through the storm. I, I had no one as an outlet to be able to talk to. I had no one that I can speak to about what I was going through. And, I, and, and it was a storm in my heart. And I went to school. And, I, and, and it was really just a, an unhappy time in my life. And I remember we moved to Landover, Maryland. And and we uh, got a townhouse and we were living there and my dad would visit on the weekends. And I, I remember one morning, January 2nd, 1983, when my, my mom said to us, you and your brother and sister are going to go to church. We had never been to church at this point. I'm 11 years old. I had never stepped into church. I never opened the Bible. I knew nothing about God. Uh, my philosophy was one of an 11-year-old that had not been taught. I thought that God would weigh out good and bad, and if I'm better and good, I'll be okay and go to heaven. And I remember mom said, you're going to church, and I was the oldest, and I kind of balked at it, didn't want to go, but she said, you're going anywhere anyway, and we went down to the bus stop where we were supposed to meet that tan bus, and, and um, the bus didn't show up. I thought my first prayer was answered. So now I can go home and I can watch the Redskins play in the playoffs. That's when they actually were good. That's actually when they were the Redskins. Or not, I don't know what team they are now. I'm a little rebellious. I still call them that. But hey. Um, then my mom woke us up again the next week and said, you're going to church. I said, mom, the bus didn't come last time. Why do you think they're going to come this time? And I remember we went down to the same bus stop waiting for that same TAM bus. TAM bus didn't show up. And then as we're walking back, we were on the end of the court that we lived in in Landover. And, and we had to walk down a sidewalk and then turn right to go down to our sidewalk to the end uh, townhouse. And right as we're getting ready to turn, we saw a blue bus out in the distance. My mom said, hey, if that's a church bus... You're going to get on it. And uh, I said, Mom, have you ever heard of strangers? <laughs> it's a different world, different age. Yeah. And she waved down the bus, and sure enough, it was church bus. 
And by the way, a bus captain's dream for three kids to wave you down that you never visited, that you don't know who they are. And, uh, and I got on that blue bus and uh, God changed my life. And uh, up until that time, I didn't have anyone that I could talk to. And, and I may have shared the testimony before in a missions conference at, at some point, but uh, I remember... I remember a little fellow, Ron Fenwick, came to our door a few weeks later. And, and I remember him coming because I remember my mom, when he would knock on the door, mom would say, go hide. Go upstairs. Shh, don't say anything. She was hiding from him because he was after her to get her into church. And, uh, but he tracked her down. He was persistent. And I remember my mom got saved. And then I remember, I remember sitting in the living room and I remember Brother Fenwick asking my mom, where, where, does, where does your, at this point, ex-husband live? Where is he? And she said, well, he's down in La Plata, Maryland, Southern Maryland. He's living with his brother. And he said, well, give me the address. And she did. And Brother Fenwick went and chased him down and led him to the Lord. And then God began to work. 18 months after I got on that bus, January 9th, 1983, 18 months later, I was standing in church in a wedding where mom and dad remarried each other, remarried each other. God put my family back together. Just yesterday, my dad and mom are up in age. I, uh, I was standing there. We had an altar full of folks being saved. And, and, and there comes my dad walking down the aisle and he goes right to the altar and he's praying and as he does every Sunday morning. God changed my life because there was a man that was willing to get up on a cold morning and get on a bus and come out and visit a route and come out and do a bus route. You see, oh, it's, God's looking for one person, one man. All through the scripture, we see that God looks for a man. We know the story when God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, and he was just looking for a righteous man to stand in the gap, as we know from the book of Ezekiel, looking for someone that is willing to stand up be, be, between God and the judgment of the people and he found no man. We're living in dark times today. We're seeing activities and events and perversions we thought we, I thought we'd never see or be accepted so widely as we do. Paul used the term perilous times. That word perilous means dangerous times. And, and can we say we are living in dangerous, perilous times in not just America, but around the world. We're living in those types of times, but uh, the reality is uh, I, I believe things are not falling apart. They're falling together. This week I was visiting for our big day and just knocking on some doors. And, and I came up to an apartment building and I was knocking on a door and there was some foul, horrible music on the other side. And, and, and I don't know about you, sometimes I want to skip those doors, but the Lord said, knock on it anyway. And I, I knocked in between the beats, you know, and got in. And finally, finally, after a moment, Guy flings the door open and says, what do you want? I said, well, I'm from Woodlawn Baptist Church and I'm in the area just inviting folks to our big day. You know what he said? He said, we're okay. And slammed the door. And I thought to myself, I was tempted to knock on the door and say, you're not okay. You're not okay. But as I, I thought about that statement and I, I thought about his words, we're okay, it really brought me to the barometer and the state of opinion of the average American, the average uh, Marylander. We're okay, but we're not okay. We're not okay. We're not okay when our inner cities look like war zones. We're not okay. We're not okay when toddlers and young children are being transitioned from one gender to the next. We're not okay. We're not okay when we're spending record amounts of money in our schools and graduating gender confused socialists. We're not okay. We're not okay when state assemblies are, uh, are 
cheering because their peers have voted in abortion to the very moment of birth. We're not okay. We're not okay when Israel is attacked by terrorists and college students are chanting on our college campuses this very week, chanting, gas the Jews. We're not okay. We're not okay when many churches have converted to social clubs and, and community organizations and, and doing anything but preaching the gospel. We're not okay. We're not okay when you can walk to the streets of Baltimore or the streets of Washington, D.C., and churches that once proclaimed the gospel are being converted to condominiums and, and are not doing anything for the gospel's sake. We're not okay in America. We're not okay when babies are being slaughtered in the womb every day. We're not okay. We're not okay when there are pedophiles in the pulpit. We're not okay. We're not okay when America is spending more on pornography than we are on foreign missions. We're not okay. The church has become dull. It has lost its edge. It has forgotten its mission. It has left its first love. Hey, listen, we're not okay. We're not okay. There are men and women, boys and girls that are just like this impotent man that are sitting in their homes and they're not okay. I think about the man, maybe not too far from here, that woke up after a weekend of not remembering what he did. He's not okay. I think about the young lady that's in an abusive relationship and is stuck in thinking about taking her life. She's not okay. We're not okay, church. I think about the boys and girls that rode our buses this very Sunday morning that have come to church and they, they walk into church and they've never been to church. We're not okay. I remember I did a funeral uh, two years ago on a summer, uh, summer day. And I remember these two little girls that came in. They were relatives of the deceased and living right in Bethesda, Maryland. Beautiful place, beautiful home. Every money that, anything money could buy. And I remember them walking in and they were looking around. You know what they said? Is this a church? We've never been in a church before. We've never been in a church before. They said on the front row, and I'll tell you, Brother Shiflet, I ignored everybody else. I said, if there's anything that I do in this service, is I'm going to do everything I can to get the gospel to those two little girls, 13 and 11. That's what I did. I preached. I don't, I don't know if I preached a funeral sermon or not. I just preached and gave the gospel. And, and my desire, my heart's desire was to see those two young ladies come to Christ. Yes, We're not okay. Right. We're not okay. Right. The early church, the first century church that had no tracks, that had no buses, that had no pews, had no technology, had no buildings, no had, Bible, no had no Christian education, had no Bible colleges. What does the Bible say about them? They filled Jerusalem with his doctrine. A, their testimony from lost people as they came into town is these are the guys that turn the world upside down. Hear me this morning. This is our time. This is our time as the church to rise up. This is our moment in church history. There's a man, there, there, there's a woman in this room that if you give your life to God, God can use you in great and mighty ways. My burden this morning is for Bowie, Maryland. My burden is that no one in our community will be able to echo the words of this man and say, I have no man. I've told our church many times, I, I, I want our church to be such a soul winning church, such an out uh, looking church that when somebody knocks on their door, they don't think it's the Mormon. They don't think it's a Jehovah witness. They don't think it's the pizza guy. They don't think it's the solar panel guy. They think it's the Baptist church down the road. We want to be out in the community yes. talking to people about Jesus yes, sir. because we're not okay. Yeah. I believe God is looking for someone to make a difference to stand in the gap. We read these stories in the Bible and sometimes we just read it as duty. We just read it because that's what we're supposed to do and we don't let it affect our hearts. What is our response to such a story? What is our response to the dark world that we live in? What is our response to a society that is out of control? I believe right here 
in a, just a few verses, we see some principles that we can take from this, this passage and use them in our day in 2023 for the glory of God. Number one, I would say, don't walk away. We see in verse six, when Jesus saw him lie, Jesus didn't walk away from the problem. He faced the problems. Hey, too many churches are walking away from the problems of society because they're too hard to deal with. Young people, don't walk away from the problems. Face them. Address them. You know why we're in trouble as a nation? It's because the church a long time ago walked away. We're okay with our, our, our bubble and as long as no one comes in our bubble and disrupts us, it, do what you want out there. And guess what? It's affecting the church now. Because we've not done our duty, not taken our, our responsibility uh, seriously. You know, God's ordained three institutions, right? Yes. He ordained the home. He ordained uh, human government. He has ordained the church. Wouldn't you think if God ordained those three institutions that he expects his people to be involved in all three institutions? Sure. And yet we've allowed, uh, we've allowed the, the world, the flesh, the devil to, to intervene in all those areas. And now look, the family's a mess. The, the, the church has been uh, infiltrated by creepers like Jude talks about in, in our government. Lord, have mercy. Yes, exactly. Lord, have mercy. Yes, sir. We're run, our, our government is being run by people that hate God, hate Bible, hate prayer, don't want anything to do with it. Right. You know, somewhere along the line, God's people said, we're not going to be involved in such things. And we're reaping what we have sown. We're reaping what we have sown. Jesus didn't walk away from this man. In fact, aren't you glad that if you read the, the, the Gospels, you know what Jesus did? He kept walking into problems. He kept looking for the people that need it. The, John chapter 4, I must needs go through Samaria. There was a woman that needed help. He said, I'm going to go help her. Everywhere, Aren't you glad for the time that Jesus came by your way? I, I'll never forget. I'll never forget that morning when I got on that bus for the very first time. And I will tell you, every January when the Lord helps me to get there because of schedule, I try to go over to Kent Village, Landover, Maryland, and I sit in my car and I, and I look down West Forest Road and I remember the moment that God changed my life because I got on that bus. Hey, listen, don't forget where you came from. Amen. Don't forget where you came from. Yes, sir. This Sunday, I already pre prepared the message for this coming Sunday, and and, and it, it talking about the twelve stones that Joshua took out of the uh, of the Jordan River yes. for what purpose? So they can tell their children and grandchildren what God did. Right. And listen, there's a a group of people at Woodlawn Baptist Church that don't know the story, don't know the sacrifice, don't know what our church went through. As we were a Wesleyan church and our pastor said, we're not Wesleyan, we're independent, fundamental Baptists. And when he made that decision, the building that we had, that we paid for, the building that we invested in was taken from us. We had no building and we were sent to have church in the school. And then men and women in our church sacrificed. I remember I was there, 11 years old. I, in January, I was in a school. By November, we had bought the property that we're in. And I remember the, I remember the time in the school where 16 couples came forward to sign their name to a document to say, we will guarantee the loan to get that building. Family sacrificed. Family sacrificed. And as a little boy, it made an impression on me that these men and women were willing to put their fortunes on the line to see this church move forward for God. You know what, the, you know what needs to be done? There's a new crowd at Woodlawn that this Sunday night, I'm going to teach them what God did. I'm going to show them some of the stones. I'm going to show them what God did over here. I'm going to show them what God did over here. 
Hey, listen, that building's not there by accident. It's a miracle of God. It's, it's there because a man stood on principle and said, we will not compromise. We will stand for what is right. We will pay the price no matter what it is to stand on the book, to stand for what God is saying. Listen, Christian, don't walk away. There is too many people depending on you to walk with God. Question, what has the Holy Spirit been prompting you to do? But you walked away. You walked away. You said, well, I don't want to deal with that. Foreign missions, whew. Lord, I'm, I'm living comfortable. You want me to go where? Oh, God, I, I've got a career path. I've got plans. You mean Bible college? But Lord, you're walking away. I, I don't know about Brother Schiff, but I'm sure knowing churches like I, I believe I do, there are people in every congregation in older ages that say, man, I wish I said yes to God when I was younger. I wish I had yielded my life to God when I had the strength, the energy, the zeal, the opportunity. Don't walk away. Look for the needs. Look for the opportunities to make a difference. Jude said some have compassion making a difference. I'm thankful that my bus captain and my preacher had compassion, wanted to make a difference. What else? What did Jesus do? Well, we know Jesus, Jesus was the answer. He is the truth. He's what this impotent man needed. The truth was standing right in front. Isn't it amazing so many times in the Gospels, the, the Lord uh, will go to a blind man, go to a lame person. What do you need? I mean, pre pretty obvious. I can't walk. Yeah. I can't see. But you know what the Lord was trying to do? Articulate what your need is. Yes, sir. Hey, listen, not only, not only, number one, should we not walk away, but number two, we see in verse number eight that Jesus said, saith unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Hey, listen, point people to the truth. Yes, Wednesday night, I was preparing our people for our big day and I was giving them some instruction and I was sharing with them, you know, just kind of a, a rallying point to get us to the big day. And one of the things that I told our folks is, listen, listen, the people that are walking into the church building, we need to point them to Jesus. Yes, we need to point them to Jesus. And I'm thankful, you know, as I was walking through Sunday school and I, I had just finished, I preached to our junior girls class and I was walking through and, and I could hear our Spanish preacher preaching. And he, you know what he was preaching? He was preaching Jesus. And then I walked around the corner and I saw our junior boys teacher. You know what he was doing? He was preaching Jesus. And then I went over around the corner and I was walking down the hall on the left side to hear our Life Builders College and Career. You know what they were doing? They were preaching Jesus. And, and I walked over the, to the adult ladies class and you know what? I heard, I heard them preaching, teaching Jesus. <laughs> yes, sir. And that's what we need to do in 2023. Hey, listen, people don't need a political agenda. They don't need to even get connected. They need Jesus. Right. Hey, listen, we, we pass laws to try to uh, curve behavior on the outside and try to change people from the outside. But I'm here to tell you, Laws can try to amend people's behavior on the outside, but Jesus changes people from the inside out. And that's what we need to do. That's what will change this world. That will, that's what will change our society and keep young men from going into stores and trying to steal stuff in the stores and act like hoodlums and burn places down. Hey, listen, when you have Jesus in your heart, you don't act that way. Hey, my, my bus captain used to sing a song, there's been a great change when I've been born again. In April 24th, 1983, as an 11-year-old boy in junior church, I accepted Christ and my Savior. And you know what? God changed my life. He changed my hunger. He changed my desires. He changed my priorities. He listen, he put me on a new path. As David said, he put a new song in my mouth. He established my goings. He changed me forever. Point people to the truth. Here this man was facing Jesus, the answer. Dundalk needs Jesus. 
Maryland needs Jesus. One of my favorite New Testament stories is the story of the gathering maniac. What an amazing story. I don't know if the Lord will allow us to see replays in heaven. I hope he does because I want to see that one. Yeah. There's a few stories. I like to see uh, the parting of the Red Sea. And I don't want to, I, I like to see the Israelis as God did that. But I also want to see Pharaoh's army as they see the waters part. Or even when the waters unpart. There's some stories in the Bible that I want to see. But I, I would love to see the, the narrative unfold with the gathering maniac. Think about this man who had no hope. They fettered him and changed. He lived in the cemetery. He was separated from his family. No one talked to him. He was an outcast. He was demon possessed. He cut himself. He, he was broken inside and out. He was hurting. He was hopeless. And then Jesus showed up. Oh my, when Jesus showed up, things changed. When Jesus showed up, the Bible says when they came back, he was clothed and in his right mind. But I want to take you a little further in the story as he goes to the city. I can almost imagine as he walks into the town and people start to say, there he is. There he is. And they maybe started to follow him to see what he was going to do. Well, maybe he was going to act foolish like he has in the past. Maybe he was act, act uh, crazy like he was and demon possessed like he was. But they looked and said, wait a minute. He's clothed. He's walking properly. He's walking through the town. You know where I think he was going? I don't think he was going to the 7-Eleven to get a taquito. I don't think he was going to Chick-fil-A to get a Chick-fil-A sandwich. You know what I believe he was doing? I think he was going home to see his family that he had been separated from. And I'm thankful to this morning. I'm thankful that you and I were the gathering maniac before we got saved. We didn't know Jesus. We were lost and undone and hopeless and on our way to hell. But one of these days, we're going to be reunited with our heavenly family, with God in heaven. I'm thankful that we can rejoice in the victorious Christian in life. I think about that man as he walking through and I, I can almost see the mom peering out the window and saying, is that my boy? Is that my boy? I can see her falling to her knees and weeping because that's her son. He's changed. And I can see the gathering maniac as he goes and says, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. I'm thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes lives. Point people to Jesus, young people. Point people to Jesus, old people, because he changes lives. We've had a soul winning program this last uh, summertime, and we've had 13 of our church members, young people and old, lead their very first person to Christ. I was showing Brother Lado, two of our teenagers, one of our bus kids, one of our school kids, led their very first person to Christ this week. That is a big deal. Amen. I'll never forget November 6, 1983, setting in that same townhouse on my back porch with my Gideon New Testament. And I remember sitting down with my friend Andre. I didn't know very much, but I knew to go to Romans 3.23. And I went through that plan of salvation and I, and I said, Andre, would you like to ask Jesus in your heart? He said, yes, I would. And I led Andre to receive Christ as Savior. I was so excited, I left him there. I left him. I went in the house, told my mom, I don't know, I don't, Andre probably was there for a few minutes. I don't know what he did. I was just excited. Hey, listen. There's nothing better than seeing someone come to Christ. Amen. It's better than what you'll see in a football a field, a baseball diamond, a basketball court. Yes, sir. It's more important than what's happening on the hall, in the halls of Congress, in our state assembly. It's transformational. It's life changing. It's eternal value. Hey, listen, point people to the truth. Last, verse number 10. Now, this man who has been impotent, not able to walk, is now walking. You would think everyone will rejoice. Nope. Verse number 10. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, Is it the Sabbath day? Is it not lawful for thee to carry thy bed? Yeah. 
The third thing you're going to have to do is overcome the opposition. Overcome the opposition. Everywhere Jesus went, you know who went with him? The Pharisees. The Pharisees went with him. Nehemiah built a wall. What God told him to do. Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem, they come and they try to infiltrate and cause trouble. If you're going to do anything for God, you're going to experience opposition. As, as a matter of fact, I'll say it this way. If you're going to do anything to make a difference for God and you're not receiving opposition, you might want, might want to reevaluate. You might want to reevaluate what you're doing. I'll tell you, the devil has fought all week. You know, I've had flat tires four times in the last 20 years. All four of them the very morning of our big day. Praise the Lord. Praise God. The devil doesn't like what God is doing. You're going to receive opposition. You know what Nehemiah did? We're going to build anyway. Nehemiah said, hey, how, how can I cease the work, come down to you? Stop worrying about what the critic has to say. Hey, stop worrying about what the, the negative person in your life has to say about you living for God. Moses was called of God. You know what happened? The murmurers showed up. Keep serving God. Hey, listen, you keep serving God. Let them watch while you work. God said, hey, I want you to go into the promised land. And God said, and the, and the spies went out to the land. And you know what? Ten of them said, we can't. There's giants in the land. You know what? They forgot the giant the God of God. And you know what? They got stalled. They got stalled. Hey, remember um, um, Moses' uh, uh, sister and brother were criticizing uh, Moses' wife and saying, we can go to God on our own. And, and you know what the Bible says? God called them out. He said, y'all three come here. You remember the story? And he gave Miriam leprosy. Leprosy. And you know what Aaron did? He cried like a baby. Oh God, I don't want leprosy. That's what he did. And you know what happened? You know what happened? Well, you don't see anywhere where Miriam really repented. But you know what happened? The whole, the whole tribe of Israel, they waited and they delayed the march for seven days, waiting for Miriam. Hey, don't hold back your friends living for God. Don't be the Pharisee, the critic. I had to make a decision. We'll close. I had to make a decision when I was 12 years old. There were three decisions I made as a young man that I don't, if I didn't make, I don't, I wouldn't be here today. Number one, I made a decision. I'll be in every church service, 12 years old, every church service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Now, mom and dad got saved, but mom and dad weren't faithful church members. So oftentimes on a Sunday afternoon, I had to make phone calls to get a ride to church or Wednesday had a call to get a ride to church and thankful. Thank God for faithful church members willing to go and pick a bus kid up and bring them to church. But I made a decision I would be in church. But number two, I made a decision not just to be in church, but be involved in the church. There are a lot of folks that are willing to sit in a pew, but don't ask me to do anything. I wanted to be involved in everything. I got involved in the bus ministry at 14 years old, became a bus captain at 18 years old, ran the night route at 19 years old, up until two years past being the pastor of the church. 
I wanted to be involved in everything, every activity, every special service. My pastor, when we got married, my pastor from the day that we got married to the day he went to heaven had never been to my house. You know why? He didn't need to visit me. Because we made a decision long time ago. We're in church. There's no voting. There's no question mark. We're in church. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, any other night, any activity, soul winning Thursday night, visitation Saturday. By the way, don't let the devil tell you you can't spend time with your family and serve God at the same time. Sure. Because you can. Sure. If you want to. If you want to. Overcome the opposition. Jesus faced the Pharisees. Remember David with Goliath? Now, David wasn't in the military. He wasn't special forces. He was bringing the Chick-fil-A. That's what he was doing. You got to read that in the Hebrew a little deeper. But then he sees Goliath and no one's doing about anything about it. And he says, I'll go. And his older brother got mad. You know, I think he got mad because he was showing him up. For being, for lacking courage, for being a sissy, for not fighting like he was supposed to. And you know the story, and the great statement is they're not a cause. And I'll go back to the beginning of our message and understand that there are men and women, boys and girls in this community that say, I have no man, I have no one that I can depend on, no one that I can talk to, and they will respond if you go to them. Is there not a cause? I know I shared this statistic with you when Brother Schiffler had me come and talk about bust them in. 85% of the school age children in the United States have never been to a Bible believing church. Not in China, not in South America, but in this country. The land of the free, the home of the brave, the land that was uh, founded as a Christian nation. 85% of the young people, junior age, school age, have never set foot in a Bible-believing church. And I'm being very broad in that definition. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Our Bible-believing churches should be overwhelmed with the amount of young people coming. Because I have found that they are searching. We had testimonies last night at our church from our big day, and one of our bus captains stood up and he said, something broke my heart this morning. He said, I made some visits, and, and he said, I remember driving down Langley Park and, and one of our workers said, stop, stop. There's a little boy, about seven years old, saw the bus, and he's running towards the bus, and there's a fence. There's a fence in between the apartment buildings, and he's trying to climb the fence, and he can't climb it because he's too little, and, and he's looking for ways to get through the fence and try to squeeze through somewhere. And I said, oh, my, what a picture of this generation they're looking for hope and there's a fence between them and the truth and he said finally one of our workers got out and they they took the fence and they pulled it back so that little boy could squeeze through and get on the bus Come on. that's the answer we need someone to take the fence and pull it back pull it back say come on through We'll bring you to Jesus. Paul said, I fought a good fight. Finished my course, kept my faith. I fought a good fight. You willing to fight this morning? You willing to stand for truth this morning? You willing to face opposition, ridicule? That third decision I made as a 12-year-old boy is I said, you know, I'm hanging around the wrong people. It's time to get some new friends. When I got saved, my best friend was a Jehovah Witness. My other friend was a Lutheran. 
My third friend was a Catholic. Sounds like a joke. <laughs> you know what I did? I got tracks. I got gospel tracks. And I said, I'm going to give tracks to all my friends. And I'm, I'm not trying to be mean here, but how they react. I'm not saying they get saved, right. but how they react to the gospel yeah. is how I'm going to react on how much time I need to spend yeah. with them. Again, I didn't say that you don't get saved. I'm not being your friend. Didn't say that. No, no, no. What I'm saying is had a, had a few friends take the track and rip it up and laughed at me and said, we don't want any of that. You're out. Yep. You're out. Have my Jehovah Witness friends say, well, I, I, can we talk? Can we talk? And from there as a 12-year-old boy, I can't, I, I will tell you, we, have, we spent countless, countless hours on my back porch talking about theology. Me sharing the Bible, showing him that Jesus is God in the flesh. That hell has fire. It's not just the grave. His name was Lee. I didn't separate from Lee. I just kept talking to Lee. Gave him the gospel multiple times. I wish I could say Lee got saved. He didn't. I don't know where he is today. But it's time maybe for some of you to say, you know what? I'm hanging around the wrong people. Maybe some of the adults, maybe you have some fellowship with people that are not healthy for you. Here's, what, here's, here's the barometer. Hang with people that are running to God, not running from God. Sure, sure. And by the way, I went to Christian school. I got a paper out. I got a job and paid my way through Christian school. And I thought when I was going to Christian school that when I showed up, everyone would have halos and everything would be great. That's what I thought going Christian school. I mean, I came from public school, eighth grade. I mean, it was rough. I mean, they were reading the Quran. That was a long time ago. They were reading the Quran in my social studies class. I brought my Bible, told my social studies teacher, can we read the Bible? No, we can't do that. So well, we got to read the Quran then. Got sent to the office. I was in eighth grade. I went to Christian school thinking everyone loves Jesus here. They're all going to be walking in. We're all doing their devotions. Talking about how they led people to Christ the day before. <laughs> I found out real quick. Found out real quick. There was a crew there that didn't want to be there. Right. And the only reason they were there is because mom and dad said you're going to go there. And I walked in, bus kid, getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to sling papers to be able to be there. And I remember I had, some, I had some tough conversations with some of my peers saying, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I got up at 3 o'clock this morning to be here. And your mama and daddy are paying your bill? And you have a bad attitude? You have a bad attitude? I remember in high school preaching chapel on Balaam's donkey. And I said, some of y'all aren't even qualified to be Balaam's donkey because you don't talk for God. Come on. Opposition. Hey, let, is it okay to serve God today or not? A man in Bethesda said, I have no man. Why don't you go find someone this week that is hopeless and down and out Pull that fence back. God will use you in a great way. Thank you, Brother Schiff. Hey, Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Brother Payne's coming quickly to the piano. The altar's open. Piano's open. Uh, altar's open. Listen, even before the piano starts to play, there's been enough challenging messages preached this morning. Every single one of us ought to be in the altar. Some of you have been saved 5, 10, 15 years. You've never led somebody to Christ. Never taken a gospel track, a New Testament